I just want to take a second and tell you why we're doing this. Um, and the inspiration behind this is, is to almost learn from the life or the story of, of real leaders. And, and the idea is this, right? So I, I blog learnings, I blog about learnings, and such blogging is about ideas, but I think real stories put those ideas in context. So, and at the end of the day, it's the same curiosity, right? It's understanding why, how, what, and all those things. So, so that's kind of what this is about. Right. Right? So I, I think I, the first question is always one uh, to do with why are you, you know, why are you doing what you're doing now? And how did you get here? So what's the, the backstory, you know, uh, what, what were the influences, I guess, uh, behind your life and career? Uh, and when you say, why am I doing what I'm doing? I mean, as a coach right now. Yes, as a coach, right? So I, I'd love to understand sort of sequentially almost. I know this is this did not, I mean, this happened, you were a VC and you were something else before that. You know, what was the rationale or why did you take each step and how did it come to this, right? Uh, so kind of the why and the how pretty much. Uh, two things occur to me as a response. The first is that, um, looking backwards through the lens of, uh, you know, hindsight, um, it's very clear to me that across all of the careers I've had, and this is really the fourth career with, uh, a couple of different side activities along the way, writing, teaching. It's very clear to me that the core of all the work I've ever done has been about what I refer to as having the conversation. Okay. Uh, one of the most important things for me in life is to connect in, in a real and authentic way with other human beings. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's like, air and water. It's absolutely essential. And so every single job I've had from being a manager to being a journalist, to being a VC and to now being a coach, every single job has in the, in the end centered around having that deep conversation. So, uh, the way I look at it is that the transitions have simply been more and more of a distillation of that process hmm. and, and a sloughing off, if you will, of the things that matter much less. So that's one response. Yeah. The other response is to tell the story of how I decided to become a coach. Yeah. Would that be helpful? That would be very helpful. Yes, very, very much. So, um, in 2001, 2002, I was entering a period of profound existential depression. Okay. And I had agreed to take a job uh, with JP Morgan. I had, in the spring of 2001, I told Fred that I, I could not continue uh, uh, in our partnership. Yeah. Which was painful because we were, we were very close friends and we'd grown up together. Um, I wasn't sure what was happening for me, but I knew that I could not make a 10 year commitment and raise a new fund. Yeah. And, uh, I went ahead and took a job with JP Morgan and began working for them officially in January of 2002. And within a very short period of time, I was exceedingly depressed to the point where I would like come into the office and lock my door and close the blinds and hide under my desk, literally. Yeah. Tell assistant Carrie, just cancel my meetings and, you know, I would just cry. And uh, eventually I, I, I came to understand that I needed to leave that position as well. Yeah. And so I did that. <clears throat> and really on, in 2003, kind of went out on my own. Um, and across 2003, 2004, and into 2005, I was mostly doing internal work that I needed to do on myself. And it was during this period that I, I did some teaching. I did a lot of writing. I served on a number of boards of directors, so I was busy. But um, I met a young man who had come to me 
to network his way to a job. And it was in that process that he um, he started asking me a series of questions and he started uh, crying one day about how miserable he was. And I gave him a book called Let Your Life Speak by a dear friend now named Parker Palmer, which is an extraordinary book. And the book had really moved me profoundly. And when he left my office, I started thinking about that exchange and I realized that this was something I wanted to do with my life. And I called a friend who was a coach at the time and I said, I think I want to be a coach. And we began a process of talking through what would, what would that entail? Um, so for me, the, it's very hard to separate the decision to become a coach from either the, uh, the path of the, of the other positions I've held as an adult or for my own internal work. Hmm. It's all about this sort of deep conversation about existentially true issues. But, but it seems from the story like you 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 lost that for a while, or or, or was that or was that the reason? You you know you went through this period between two thousand one two thousand five. Do you feel like uh, the depression came because because of a loss of those conversations, or or no? No, I think that the I think what happened was that the coping mechanisms that I had developed in my twenties and thirties. Yep to deal with the existential questions broke down. They stopped working. And I remember, for example, reading a very poignant quote um, in a book called Listening to Midlife by Mark Gerzon, who's a fabulous writer. And he tells the story of Buzz Aldrin coming back after uh, orbiting the Earth uh, and suffering a major depression. And the quote that's attributed to Buzz Aldrin is, after you've seen the Earth from the vantage point of the moon, what else is there? And I felt very similarly. I felt that the coping mechanisms that I developed in my 20s and my 30s were things like the pursuit of money, the pursuit of external affirmation and external validation, uh, and what I had realized by, the, by my late 30s was that they actually don't really work. And so they worked for a while, mm -hmm. but uh, they didn't really stave off the demons and that I had no choice but to sit still and listen. You know, I'm a Buddhist. Yeah. And when, when the way I like to tell the story is that when the Buddha... You know, Buddha was born a prince, came to understand the reality of birth, suffering, sickness, old age, death, became a wandering mendicant in the forest, became this, you know, this aesthetic um, uh, holy man, realized that wasn't enough. And the way I like to think of it is one day he decided that Fuck it. He's had it. It was enough. And he sat down under the Buddha tree and said to himself, I'm not moving until I figure it out. Hmm. I like seeing the story because for me, that's kind of what happened was I just said, I'm not going to move until I figure this out. Hmm. I'm not going to pretend anymore. And, and, and what, what emerged was Jerry the coach. I, and and I, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm still probing this because, because I'm curious in the sense that, so you say in a way the trend has still been conversations, right? So somehow the difference has not been what, it's somewhere deeper, right? So it's in sort of why you do these things and, and how you do it. So, so could you talk me through what was that change and, and you know, where did it change? So what was, did the purpose change? Or did the purpose of these conversations, like, you know, where, where did the change happen? I think that the, the, what happened was I became more connected with my own authentic truth. Um, and I became 
more fiercely dedicated to moving more and more to that fully integrated place, which is all nice and esoteric, but but, but in practical realities, what it meant was instead of having the conversation within service of creating a story, as I did as a journalist, mm -hmm. or building a company, as I did as a manager, mm -hmm. or furthering an investment, as I did as a VC, I began having a conversation essentially in furtherance of alleviation of suffering. Mm. And that changes everything. Right. So, so here, here's a question then. So as a coach, right, and, and, I've, and I've seen a couple of your other interviews where you've talked about helping entrepreneurs with depression, uh, for example, or helping, you know, people ask these why questions and stay connected. Uh, how big a role does faith uh, or spirituality play in this? Because, you know, hearing you in the last 10 minutes, has, you know, I see uh, the role that Buddhism, for example, has played in your life. So how big a role has have have you seen this play? And do you actively, you know, encourage people to almost look at faith, you know, as, as a potential way to help relieve that suffering, I guess. You, I don't think you can help them find a way out necessarily. I guess they have to do it themselves. Well, tell me again the word you're using. I, I use, uh, I, 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 so I, I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with it a little bit. So I, I'm caught between faith and spirituality. So, faith. yeah. Faith and spirituality. Uh, I don't believe yeah. that it matters what religion you believe in. No. Yeah. And I don't believe it matters whether or not you consider yourself spiritual. Mm. And I'm not sure what faith means. But I do believe that a kind of radical self-inquiry, a radical truth-telling, is absolutely essential to not only living a better existence, but also being a better leader and being able to withstand the vicissitudes and vagaries of everyday life as an entrepreneur. If you give in to the very human tendency to self-delude and trick yourself and lie to the world and lie to yourself, you actually exacerbate the uh, highs and lows of the entrepreneurial world. Hmm. So I, I, guess, I guess my question, you know, I'm going to come back to it in a way, right? So so you say, you know, I don't care. Yes, I don't care what you what what religion you believe in or, you know, whether you consider yourself spiritual. But does the fact that you believe in something outside yourself help? I guess that's my question. Yes, that um, that one of the most important ways to break through the inevitable narcissism. Yeah. So long with being an entrepreneur. Yeah. Is a connection to something much larger than yourself. Hmm. And that community, that could be family, that could be uh, the society in which you're trying to operate. It could be a faith, but it's really the sense that, you know, what I often write about is that there's, you know, that there's, there's the, the, a balance between three things, right? The inner you, the outer you, and the other. Hmm. If it's just focused on the inner you, it's, it, you, you end up potentially falling prey to a kind of self-indulgent trapped in your own mind. Mm. Certainly focus on just the outer view, then you run the risk of living life as a kind of hollow, what we would say in Buddhism is a hungry ghost, mm. just sort of the inside. Mm. If you only live for the other, then the likelihood is very great that you're going to be disconnected from an authentic self. Yeah. And so you really need to all three in balance with each other. The other, an awareness of the other, 
keeps you from being trapped in, in, in your own bullshit. Yeah. So, in your own self digital state. Yeah, so, so what you're pushing for, and I, and I see, see that you're, you know, is, is of course self inquiry, self awareness. But I, I guess I guess the question back to you then is, you know, these are great ideas, you know, if, to speak about, right? But how do you put them in context for somebody who comes to you? So, you know, what are practical habits that that you have or you would have people build, you know, to to uh, to yeah, to make this habitual, to make this a part of part of life, I guess. Uh, I'm gonna pull up a quote. Yeah. Uh, and the, the quote comes from Joseph Campbell. And bear with me while Microsoft Word loads. No, um, and your question is, you know, are there things that you can do sort of on a practical everyday basis? Yes. yes. Microsoft Word is very slow. <laughs> Uh, it generally is slower when you put it on the spot. <laughs> exactly. Well, I apologize. I can't pull it up right now. Let me see if I can grab this. Google can help, maybe. That's what I'm doing. <clears throat> Here's a good quote. Yeah. Joseph Campbell, writing in The Power of Myth, says, you must have a room or a certain hour a day when you don't know what's happening in the newspapers that morning, a place where you can simply experience and bring forth what you are and what you might be. Yes. Now, I think that if we spend a little bit of time every day, very pragmatic piece of advice, if we spend a little bit of time every day, cut off from the noise. I don't care if it's a walk. I don't care if it's sitting meditation or journaling or exercise or just staring at the sky. A little bit of time every day, just reconnecting with you, without your title, your uh, obligations, your responsibilities, the things that plague you all day long, just a little bit of time every day. I think it, it builds a kind of foundation that enables you to then go forth and work your tail off. Who, who are the people who watch your interviews? Who are the people who are, who are coming to the website? Mm, it, it's a real mix. So I have a, a whole bunch of people who, who show up, who read up, my, who read my blog, and that's a very wide variety. I think a, a, a large one, a large group would be, you know, people of my age, I guess, in, in their mid twenties, are all looking to do stuff, to learn, uh, you know, to figure out what to do next. I, I think I think that would be one part. But I think there's a big tech community side as well, uh, you know. Uh, I think all the people that you've talked about, I mean, really, all of us, can benefit from a little bit of quiet time Yeah. in that sense. One of the great things about wisdom traditions like religions is that there's a prescribed, generally speaking, there's a ritualized prescribed time of disconnection. Yeah. Sabbath. Yeah. It's a period of fasting. It's a period of self-reflection. And many, many people are so um, used to these rituals that they don't necessarily use the time period for the kind of reflection that they were designed for. Yeah. But if you can reconnect to that, it's very powerful. Um, so, you know, practically speaking, what I often say to a client is, you know, how about just having lunch by yourself, not in front of a screen? Yeah. 
What a radical concept. What if you went for a walk around the building? What a radical concept. What if you walked home instead of taking the subway? What if you went for a bike ride and not listened to the iPod? What if you drove your car with the radio off? Yeah. What if you didn't turn the TV on? And most importantly, what if you didn't check email? <gasps> <laughs> right? What if you rode an elevator without checking your phone? What would happen? It almost what? seems like a, a push for uh, a bit of introversion, right? Um, where in a, in a world that is pretty uh, obsessed with the extrovert sort of ideal of, you know, um, yeah, some sort of connection or addiction. I think you make a good point. Look, I'm an introvert. So many of these things feel comfortable and natural to yeah. me. Um, but I am just as drawn to the distractions as anybody else. Yeah, fair enough. Maybe there's something that the quiet introvert can teach the rest of us, can teach the world. Maybe there's something beneficial about opening a book and reading some poetry. Yeah. So, so, so final couple of questions. I know, I know we're edging past the 20th minute mark. Uh, I think one, one of it is how do you put all these principles so, uh, in, in your life? So what's a day... Uh, you know, what are some of the habits that you develop that, that help you be effective? Well, I'm very boring at night because I tend to go to bed around 9, 9.30. Same here. <laughs> Somewhere between 5 and 6 a.m. Um, I journal, with usually with a cup of tea. Um, I meditate. Um, and then either I'll check email at that point or more often than not, I'll go to the gym and exercise. Um, and then, um, it's a, it's a lovely way to start the day. It takes time. I generally wake up two hours before I'm supposed to leave. And that's a kind of shocks people. I try not to engage with a screen of any sort after like 9, 9.30 because I find that it's just too loud. Yeah. Um, and that's very typical for me. That's a typical day. And then the day proceeds. And, and oftentimes the day is very full. Sometimes it's highly emotionally draining. You know, if I have seven, eight, nine, sometimes ten sessions in a day, it's a long day. I'm working hard. It's yeah. 10 hours. But for me to be fully present for my clients, for me to be fully present in my life, I need that ritual. I need that time. So does that answer your question? That, that does. That, that, that fully does. I guess my final question to you is, is there a, um, you know, you, you've heard the audience, right? It's, a, it's an eclectic mix of people. Uh, and that's the nice thing about the modern day, right? It's a random person can, you know, connect with so many. So I guess, you know, do you have a message or a, a, a quote or an idea that, that inspires you that you would like to share? Yeah, don't take it so seriously. You know, um, have fun. Breathe. Chill out. Um, no matter, you know, I call my blog the monster in your head because... 90% of the time, I spend time talking people out of their crazy fears. So what would happen if you fail? So what? So what? Relax. Trump and Rinpoche, one of my teachers, used to call it, no big deal. It's no big deal. So that would be it. It's no big deal. That's wonderful, Jerry. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking, taking the time.